Hello to a record uh, group of participants, over a thousand people. Uh, wow. We are all calling in from our various places where we're sheltered in place. But I think we've all discovered that technology can keep the human connection going and keep these important initiatives going. So thank you, Chris, for reimagining with our diversity council, uh, which is uh, many of these gold standard key companies. Uh, you've been deep participants in formulating this body of work, including our, our, our landmark benchmarking study on Asian talent and companies, best practices, the awards, and all the work that we do. This year, in fact, we're committed to broadening that discussion and making sure that we have the difficult and uncomfortable conversations, but the important ones that involves self-evaluation, institutional evaluation, and taking a look at how we're doing on this front after so many decades of discussions and commitments and trying to do better. Where are we really? And I think the events of, of George Floyd and that we've seen unfolding show us that we have to do better. We have to do better. And I will say at Asia Society, we have committed to having the uncomfortable conversations really looking at things that maybe we haven't been able to put on the table before and how to create a safe space for those discussions among our staff, with our board, with our contributors and partners in the world, and hosting some of those discussions. And so uh, in that process, I've had many, many discussions with our global board of trustees. And one that really struck me was with Sonny Kelsey. It strikes me because part of our work today will be to look at, is there a connecting point? Is there a bridge between our work in looking at how Asians are viewed, how they are treated in companies, in their effort to aspire to be participants in the world's greatest companies, but also to break through levels of management and take leadership roles. And we've discovered that some of your companies have really pioneered groundbreaking ways to have that inclusion and have found it really important to the bottom line. Uh, if we look at the world of consumers and customers um, and partners in, in deals that are being made, now uh, the East and the West are very blended together. But also, is there commonalities to what we've learned that can extend to the inclusion of Black Americans and a broader view of what diversity is to the benefit of our companies, our society, and the world that we want to build. And so Sonny, I will say, has a unique story. Uh, he, I'm going to let him tell his story himself. Many of you have stories, and I know many of you have been having these uncomfortable conversations, but hopefully Sonny and I will be able to kick off some safe space to talk about some very uncomfortable things and set a tone for what I hope will be an amazing uh, symposium today and tomorrow. So, Sonny, uh, we've introduced you. Uh, you were born in London. Your family roots are in India. You came to the United States at two years old and ended up yep. in the South, in the U.S. at 10 years old. Tell us a little yep. bit about that journey, because what I do know is you were one of the first CEOs I saw to jump online, to tweet, to get out in front of these issues and say we must do better. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Josette, for uh, for having me this morning, and I'm really honored to uh, uh, to be here. I will say I feel a little bit uh, guilty in a way sharing my experiences because, look, my experience has been a fraction um, of what many others have experienced for so long. But as you said, I think it's important we all kind of share our different experiences. Um, so as you said, you know, my parents are first generation immigrants from India. They stopped in England for a few years. My dad got an education and I, I was born when they were there. You know, we, when we first came to the United States, we lived in upstate New York. And I say that because we lived in a very ethnically diverse community. Um, actually, there are a lot of other Indian families, but also a lot of other Asian families, you know, uh, blacks, whites, et cetera. And then we moved to Tennessee in 1979. And um, let's just say it was pretty striking. Um, you know, my uh, my first day in school there was in sixth grade. Uh, I was called the N word, and I got to tell you, when it was, someone referred to me as the N word, I actually looked around. I, I didn't know who they were talking to. It, it actually, you know, it really, it, it just, it right off the bat. Um, a couple of things that I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit it, but I kind of accepted as normal at the time. Um, 
my hometown, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, was segregated. Um, uh, now, I, I think it had been segregated a long time ago, but the segregation had lasted. So most of my black friends lived in one part of town. Um, uh, there had been busing. Um, and, uh, you know, it really it was a, it was a community where, generally speaking, there was some interaction between uh, uh, blacks and whites, but not a lot. Um, and not, not, not in any kind of way that you would think is normal. Um, and you know, look, I think back on that, by the way, I want to say one thing. Most people were awesome, right? So it's not, uh, you know, I, I think this was really important. Most people were awesome, but there was definitely a vocal minority, um, who, um, one didn't know how to deal with me, uh, and my sister, uh, there were very few Asians in town and not really sure what bucket to put us in. And it's really, it's always been fascinating to me how it's just so critical to some people to put people into buckets. But, you know, that, that obviously had a very formative influence on me. Um, uh, you know, a lot of experiences. I'll, maybe I'll just pause there. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Sonny. And part of what we've been exploring is how do we move beyond what uh, often is the starting and ending point of a conversation. And it may be someone saying, what you've done has hurt me, or what you've done has excluded me, or what you've done. And the other person saying, I'm not a racist, my intentions are good, and it kind of stops there. And how do we stretch that conversation to one where we can say, there's a safe space to say, let me understand what you're feeling. And so what you're explaining is a world and later on Wall Street when you went to break into the world of finance, where maybe you felt things coming that others maybe didn't even intend, but we, we don't get beyond this. There's right. an unsaid yeah. piece of that. <laughs> Yeah, look, and I think, you know, 40 years ago when I, when you know, 40 plus years ago when we moved to the South or 30 years ago when I started my career on Wall Street, and it's look, to your question, your question and your comment about how do we move beyond this and how do we get to a point where it's just not accepted? I got to tell you, I just accepted it. The, you know, when I, I I felt really fortunate to get my job at a great Wall Street firm, and I remember my first day of training, and I looked around, and you know, there were a few women, um, there were really no other people of color, and I just kind of accepted that. And in fact, one of the things I remember really trying hard to do is just to assimilate as much as I could because I kind of felt like that's what I needed to do. Um, I know I had to work a lot harder than a lot of other people to get to the same place, and again at the time I accepted it. Like I kind of just said, look, I can't, I wasn't really sure what the path was. It was either I played by those rules uh, or I didn't get to play in the game. Um, and so now yeah, look, to be very fair, um, you know, the, I, I would say that the racism I experienced growing up was overt racism. I think a lot of it comes from ignorance and hate. I think the racism I experienced, especially early in my Wall Street career, was more about exclusion and or not or maybe not being included and just knowing I wasn't included in, in that club. And by the way, I know there are a lot of other people, whether it's different ethnicities. I personally also believe I'm sure women feel very similarly, certainly at that point, um, that there was a, you know, for lack of a better term, there's an old boys club uh, and an old white boys club. And if you weren't part of that old white boys club, um, you had to, you know, you had to do a lot of different things to figure out you're never going to be in the club. And that's one thing I had to, I came to terms with eventually. So then you just had to hustle harder to make sure that you, you know, you had an opportunity to stick around an opportunity to succeed. In early May, based on the, um, blatant, uh, attacks that many Asians have felt in the COVID era. Uh, where people are blaming Asians or attacking. And so we've seen a lot of those incidents. We held a symposium to have a dialogue between Black American leadership, Asian leadership, and uh, we had the Anti-Defamation League there to talk about common experiences. I was struck when Van Jones said that, you know, from his point of view, uh, such an amazing commenter on these issues, he's always viewed Asians as the privileged group the ones who were the pace setting. And he said he's been taught to see how that lens can be turned on them and that he wanted to offer a hand of friendship because they've also been some of the most rewarding relationships in his life. 
And so one unspoken territory that our trustees have brought up is Asian racism toward blacks, other groups not accepting the other group or feeling threatened by that. And can we have a much more in-depth dialogue about those issues? I think it's really critical to have. Um, I agree with Van. I think generally speaking, look, I think I don't think anyone's had it as tough as black Americans. Right. Um, and I, I really believe it is the original sin of the founding of this country. Um, but I also believe that, um, uh, in, like I said before, I, I feel the the racism. Look, let's just be really candid about this. Right. You said make uncomfortable statements. The president of the United States on this last Saturday at a rally, which was nationally televised, called the coronavirus the Kung flu, right? The president of the United States. If you, um, I will not get or go any further. I will not make any other political statements. I will say that if we are not, I mean, nothing's gonna change um, in this country if we don't have respect, uh, and if we don't, um, you know, people aren't held to a higher standard. Um, and I, I just, I, I would say that, you know, Josette, you and I have talked about it. You know, my family is Sikh, right? So many of my relatives, actually most of my uh, uncles still wear a turban. Uh, my father doesn't. Uh, but, uh, you know, after 9-11, um, there was a huge amount of race, a, a huge amount of actually not only racism, but a huge amount of attacks that were, you know, uh, against the Sikhs, against the Sikh community because people didn't understand. Right. I view that as ignorance. You know, maybe there's some hate, but I view that as ignorance for sure. Um, the racism that I think uh, Asian Americans have been experiencing in the last few months, it's 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 ignorance. But, you know, when it's coming from the highest authority in the land, um, I got to tell you, uh, not that I want to cut anyone's slack for being a racist, but they're not getting a great role model. Right. And I think that's where we got to have the uncomfortable conversations. And I think we got to start owning this. And I do believe that, uh, you know, you made a comment about uh, some of the stuff we've been doing as a company and some of the how we've been vocal about it. Look, my view is if pri when, when the public sector is not showing leadership that it needs to show, the private sector has to step up, right? And so whether it's, if it's not coming from a federal level, if it's coming from other parts of government, if it's not coming from a federal level, if it's coming from the private sector, it has to happen. Um, uh, and I'm obviously super passionate about that. Yeah. Well, you had said in one of your tweets, we cannot let our inaction become part of the narrative. We have to act. And I want to get to this point. Uh, there are countless examples, really, of the private sector being the lead, being at the vanguard of changes in society that have brought about you know, real benefits and broaden the lens of inclusion. Uh, this is a moment where we see some of that pace setting what are some of the things that can be done in the boardroom to get this better and also to, with our own uh, employees and teams to, to make a safe space for a broader discussion, to deepen our own uh, ability to do better at this and our company's ability and to help set the pace for the country? So I think, first of all, I think the biggest thing I think we have to all remember is talk is cheap, right? So uh, anyone can talk. Look, I can, we as a company can put that tweet out, right? And if we do not follow up on that with tangible action, um, then I believe that George Floyd's murder will be in vain and a lot of other things that have happened or not. I do believe I'm hopeful this time and I'm hopeful for a couple of reasons. One, I think is I don't think people are going to let this go. Uh, number two, thankfully, the much maligned millennials and the younger generation are passionate about this. You know, if uh, I, I, I participated in a couple of the protests and the crowds were 90 percent white. And that to me was super powerful. So, look, we as a company, uh, we have a lot of work to do. We're no, we're no paradigm or virtue at all. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, the business that we had built before we merged uh, last year, I was always very proud to say we were only 45% white males. <laughs> now, I have no problem with white men. I love white men. They're some of my best friends in life. But, uh, you know, in an industry, my industry, which is 80% white men, you know, we worked really hard on that. You know, that was, it was a conscious decision to do that. 
and we're going to do the same now with a much bigger firm that we're part of. Um, so uh, we we had a very uncomfortable discussion last week with our uh, black colleagues and Affinity Group discussion. I don't want to get into details because it would not be fair to them. Other than to say I didn't know what to expect, we we allotted an hour for it. It could have gone three hours, um, you know, and, and people were very open. They were sharing. That was really important to me because that made me feel like, okay, these people believe that at least right now this is a safe space. Someone's going to listen to them. And I got to tell you, I, I, I'm, my team gives me a hard time because I don't take a lot of notes. I haven't taken that many notes in five years, right, in terms of just – and we're coming out with real specific action plans. And, you know, we haven't – since we haven't laid these out yet, I'm not going to get into the details yet because I don't think it's appropriate for my team to hear about it, you know, on, at the for, not for me, but the two specific things we're going to do is we're going to set hiring targets every year, meaning that a, a the vast majority of the people we hire, the vast majority of the people we hire every year will be women or minorities, number one. Um, and number two, set goals so that one, three, five years out, as a result of that, that we've got a much more diverse team. Um, and I'm going to hold ourselves accountable to it. I'm going to basically put financial uh conditions tied to it, which means that if we don't hit it, we're going to penalize ourselves for it. Um, so that's what we're well, going to sorry, do. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Joanna. Sonny, we, so. we just have a minute left, and I, I have one last question for you. Um, I, I ask everyone who's who's part of the symposium to ask themselves, have you had more conversations about this issue, more serious conversations, more honest, that everyone I talk to is having that? And so the question is, um, are we at a tipping point? Are we finally, and we've seen this happen. We've seen this happen with gay rights movement. We've seen change happen and society adjusts for capable of making real change and getting at this. Are we, are we at one of those moments? I really hope so. I think so. I'm a eternal optimist though, so I have to take anything I say with a grain of salt. Look, last week was a great week, right? Some of the decisions which came out of the Supreme Court were all about inclusion. Uh, and inclusion, I think, is a synonym for love personally, but it was all about inclusion. Some of the different decisions that were taken about the LBGTQ plus community or about the dreamers or about some of the... So that's awesome, right? And so I really believe we are. I believe that there is... Um, I just believe this is too important to too many people. I, I saw an announcement earlier about uh, something that Goldman Sachs is doing in a very positive way. Look, I have a very simple point of view on this, Josette. Um, minorities are minorities because we're a minority. Like right? we're not the majority, right? And so, unless change is important to the majority, right? So if it's not if 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 it's not important to white people, and very specifically, if it's not important to white men to see equity and inclusion and fairness and diversity, it's not gonna happen. And I really do believe this time we're there. And one thing we have found in our benchmarking and with the really uh, forward-leaning companies that have been involved in part of this, it makes business sense. And the transformation, it's about goodwill, it's about, of course, being better as a nation, as people, as companies, but it also, broadens the possibilities and lifts companies up in their markets and customers and intuition and insights into reaching a broader audience. So I think the conclusion of our work so far has been that. And uh, hopefully our discussions over the next two days will really lead to the fact that, you know, this is, you know, I think a proven win for the, the companies that have set the pace uh, it's something, and we have an opportunity now for the business community once again to lead on an area that society is is dealing with in a very difficult way. So thank you, Chris. I think we're back to you. Thank you, Sonny. And, thank uh, you so much, Joseph. Thank you, everyone, thank you. who's become part of it.